For example, in the starting of the month of Ramadan, in the sighting of moon, you require one witness. In the ending of Ramadan, you require two witnesses. It does not make a difference whether it's a male or a female. Only in some country it has to be a man, should have a beard of the standard fist, then only can you take the witness. And I have one more strong argument that the beloved wife of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Hazrat Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her. She has narrated no less than 2,210 ahadith. 2,210 ahadith. And she was the only witness. So 2,210 say hadith, which are basis of the Sharia, is a witness only of one woman. She was the wife of the Prophet. Hazrat Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her. So this clearly indicates that one witness of woman is equal to one witness of man. There are cases in which how in financial transaction men is preferred to women. There are certain cases in which women witness is taken, men witness is not taken. For example, while giving the burial bath of a female Muslimah, witness should be a woman. A man cannot be a witness. Unless in certain conditions where it's a forest and there are no human beings, then the husband can be. But otherwise, generally, for the burial bath, for the janaza ghusl of a woman, the witness is accepted of a woman, not of a man. The 16th most common question asked about Islam is that why does Islam do injustice to women? by only allowing 50% of the share given to the male counterpart. That why do women in Islam inherit only half what is inherited by the male counterpart? It's injustice to them. This is the 16th most common misconception. As far as inheritance is concerned, the Quran speaks about inheritance in several places. In Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 180, Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 240, Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 79, Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 19, Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 33, Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 106 to 108. Several places it speaks about inheritance, but the exact share is mentioned in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse number 11 and 12, and Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 176. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 11, that as for the inheritance of your children, the male will get double the share of the female. If only daughters, two or more, they share in a two-third. If only one daughter, she gets half. In what you leave for your parents, if there are children, the parents each get one-sixth share. If no children, the mother gets one third. If there are brothers and sisters, the mother gets one sixth. Verse number 12 says, In what your wives leave for you after death? The husbands, they get half if there are no children. They get one fourth if there are children. In what you leave for your wives? The wives get one fourth if there are no children, one eighth if there are children. Don't get confused. Difficult to remember. Go home, open the Quran, don't know Arabic, read the translation, Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 11 and 12. Generally I agree, in majority of the cases, the female inherits half of that of the male counterpart. But there are cases in which female and male inherit exactly the same. As I mentioned, if the person who has died has children, mother and father both get one-sixth. Or if the person who has died has got no children, but leaves a brother and sister, both get one-sixth. There are cases in which sometimes the female inherits double. If a female dies and leaves behind no children, but has a husband and mother and father, the husband gets half, mother gets one-third, the father gets one-sixth. So mother gets double than the father, but there are rare cases. I do agree as a normal general policy, the female inherits half of that of the male counterpart. If it's daughter and son, son inherits double than that of the daughter. 
husband and wife husband inherits double than that of the wife i agree with it what is the logical reason the reason as i mentioned earlier the financial burden in islam is put on the shoulders of the men as far as the women are concerned before she's married it's the duty of the father and the brother and after she's married it's the duty of the husband and the son to look after a lodging boarding clothing and all financial aspects she need not work for a living she's financially secured based on this allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put the shares and let me give you an example suppose there's a person who dies and leaves behind 150000 dirhams and he has one son and one daughter after giving the shares of the wives and the other relatives if 150000 dirham are remaining from his inheritance and he has one son and one daughter the son will inherit 100000 dirhams and the daughter will inherit 50000 dirhams now i am asking you a question would you prefer being a son who inherits 100,000 dirhams and maybe 80 to 90 percent of that wealth you may have to spend on your family because you are the bread earner or would you prefer inheriting 50,000 dirhams and keeping everything for yourself not even spending a single dirham on anyone else so logically but naturally you prefer inheriting 50,000 dirhams and not spending a single dirham on anyone else rather than inheriting 100,000 dirhams and spending 80%, 90%, 100% of it on looking after the other members of the family. That's the reason Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is just. If he would have given both of them equal share, then I would have to give a talk on men's rights in Islam. Then the men would object. What kind of religion is this? We have to look after the family and when we inherit, we inherit equal. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees to it that is just with everyone as Allah says in Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse number 40 Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is never unjust in the least degree the 17th most common question asked by the non-muslim regarding Islam is that why do Muslims believe in life after death how can you prove logically about the year after about life after death and many a time there are non-muslims who pose this question to me Brother Zakir, you're a medical doctor. You have given a lecture on Quran modern science. You are so scientific. But how do you believe in this blind belief, life after death? Science hasn't proved it. So they pose the question that if Islam is a logical religion, how do you justify life after death? I tell them that life after death is not just a blind belief. It's a logical belief. And I've given the talk on Quran modern science. And I've said that there are more than 6,000 verses of the Quran, out of which more than a thousand verses of the Quran, they speak about science. But today, science hasn't advanced so much to prove everything of the Quran. So if we analyze, say approximately 80% what the Quran speaks, which is related with science, has been proved to be 100% correct. 20% it is ambiguous. Neither right, neither wrong. We don't know. So when 80% of the Quran is proved to be 100% perfect according to scientific facts and 20% is neither wrong, neither right, not even 0.1% of the 20% has been proved wrong, my logic says when 80% is 100% correct and 20% is ambiguous, my logic says that inshallah, even that 20% would be correct. So it is a logical belief. It is not a blind belief. This is one way of proving life after death. The other strategy I use to prove about life after death is by asking a common question. That is robbing, good or bad? And I'd like to ask you that question here from the audience. Is robbing good or bad? Good or bad? Bad. Who says robbing is good? Raise your hand. No one, mashallah, mashallah. Large audience, maybe more than 15,000. Not a single person says robbing is good. Now I, I am trying to impersonate. For example, I am a logical person. I am a scientific person. I am behaving like a non-Muslim, like an atheist. 
but I claim myself to be a logical person and a scientific person and I say that robbing is good. Believe me, I am a logical person, I am a scientific person. I say robbing is good and I like robbing. And I am giving you a chance, this large audience of more than 15,000 people, I am giving you a chance to prove to me robbing is bad and I will stop robbing. I've told you, I'm a logical person, I'm a scientific person. Give me one logical reason why robbing is bad for me and I will stop robbing. I will tell you why it is good for me. When I rob a person, I can go and eat biryani, I can go to a five-star hotel, easy, easy money. Now you tell me why robbing is bad, don't give me 10, 20 reasons, give me only one logical scientific reason why robbing is bad and I will stop robbing. Can anyone give me? Yes, brother. If you rob someone, can you speak a bit louder, mashallah? Very good. Brother Singh, if I take something from...